So today's uh, t talk is by uh, Dr. Ned Gilbert. He's a research team leader with the UCL and uh, other institution uh, Extreme Everest expeditions. So he's going to talk about the previous one and also talk about the new one that's just coming up. Ned. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very honored. Uh, so today I am talking about Extreme Everest 2, which is an uh, expedition we're undertaking in about two months' time. Um, but I will also be talking a little bit about the previous expedition, as Paul's just mentioned. By background, I'm a medical uh, doctor. I'm an anesthetist and intensive care doctor. Um, but I've taken time out of my clinical work to do a PhD here at UCL. I've also, medics have real problems I, I guess it could be called a problem, talking in medical lingo. So I've really tried to not talk in medical lingo. So please shout at me if I do start going off into medical chat. So in summary, what will I talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about Case Medicine, which is the group that oversees these expeditions. Uh, what we do at Case Medicine and why we do it. It gives you an idea why we do these crazy things. The first expedition, which was done in 2007, which is Extreme Everest or Cordwell Extreme Everest, and then Extreme Everest 2, which, as I say, we're in the process of. Beforehand, though, I'd just like to go through what we call a clinical case. As a doctor, when you're in hospital, whether you've been in hospital or whether you are doctors, you'll find yourself presented as, as this, really. So if I present a clinical case to you all, it's of a 34-year-old male. He describes himself as fit and well, though you may argue otherwise, if you know you're the chap. He's got no significant medical history. He doesn't take any medications. He's 67 kilograms, and he's 178 centimeters tall. So pretty standard average male. When you look at him, and we like to look at people, we do this ABC that you may have heard about. He's chatting fine. His airway is OK. His respiratory rate, so the rate at which he's breathing, is 60 breaths per minute. A normal breathing rate is about 12. So he's really, really panting. His oxygen saturation, so when we measure how much oxygen he's got in his blood, should be around 99 or 100%, is about 34%. And his heart rate is double normal. So it's as if he's just been sprinting 100 meters. He's got normal blood pressure. And his Glasgow Coma Scale, which tells us neurologically how intact he is, is 15 out of 15. So he's fully lucid, chatting, coherent, and happy. But his numbers are really, really odd. Now. In a hospital, if you were to go to A&E and you were very unwell and you had a chest infection or something, and you had numbers anywhere near this, or even half as bad as these were, as a doctor would take some blood from your wrist and look at how oxygenated that blood is. And we measure the oxygen levels in that blood. So if I was to take some oxygen from anyone in this room, some blood, and measure the oxygen levels, the number would be about 15 kilopascals. So think of the number 15. If we do that in A&E and a patient has... So uh, a blood level of about eight, we really get worried and we'll call the intensive care doctors and they'll contemplate putting this person into an induced coma and putting them on a ventilator because eight is a worryingly low number of, for, for oxygenation. So this chap, we did a blood gas on him and his numbers were 2.55. So that is very, very low. And in fact, I've never ever seen an oxygen level anywhere near that, anywhere even near five in the hospital setting. Um, and it's actually the lowest number ever recorded for a blood oxygen level in a live patient. And he's very proud if you ever meet this person. So where did we meet this person? Well, this is where I work on a day-to-day -day basis, and it wasn't here. I mean, if it had been here, I would have been extremely, extremely, extremely worried. I'd be yeah, very worried indeed. But it was, in fact, here. So this is Mount Everest. It's covered with this ominous-looking lentiform cloud on top of it. And if you look at the screen, to the right, you can almost see a little balcony. And the chap we've just described had just been up to the summit and had just decided to stroll down the mountain. On his way down, they put up a little tent, and they thought it'd be a good idea to drop their trousers and get a friend who had equally as little oxygen in his blood to get a big needle and prod it in his groin. Now, rather him than me, but uh, they did do it. And that's where we got the numbers from. So why on earth, or what persuaded someone to drop their trousers on the summit of Mount Everest to, to be stabbed with a needle? Well, I'll have to go back to the very beginning to explain why they wanted to do that, what they found, and what is useful. Of note also in this slide is there's a chap in a 
a yellow jacket. And he's the, the Sherpa that led them up the top of the summit, that 24 people went up to the summit. This was in the 2000 expedition. And they were led by this Sherpa, who looks like he's doing a runner. And he was actually doing a runner, because in his thermos flask is not a good bit of British tea, but it's some blood samples. And he's about to run down the mountain to analyze those samples. And to give you an idea, the team, so Dan, who had his blood taken, they descended from the summit to base camp in about 48, 49 hours. The Sherpa ran down in about an hour and a half. So they're pretty remarkable people, and we'll come back to them shortly. But uh, yes, if you ever do it, walk down, don't run. So as I said, I have to explain what they were doing there, why they were doing it. So it goes back to case medicine. Now, case medicine is, uh, belongs to UCL, and it's the Center of Altitude, Space, and Extreme Environment Medicine. And it was set up in about the year 2000 by two doctors who work here now, a chap who's now Professor Dan South called Mike Grocott and a doctor called Kevin Fong, who's always on TV. Now, these doctors are intensive care doctors. And they, as they strolled around their wards, found that about 90% of patients in intensive care suffer from problems with oxygenation and low levels of oxygen. And they use a word called hypoxia or hypoxic, which means if someone is hypoxic, it means they are suffering from low levels of oxygen. I'll try and not use that word, but if I do say it, it gives you an idea why. So these doctors thought, well, 90% of our patients are suffering from low levels of oxygen, be it because they've got problems with breathing, because problems with their heart, they've just had an operation, they're suffering severe infection, but they had problems with oxygenation. They also know that in medicine, to progress treatment and to change treatment, it's all really evidence-based driven, so evidence-based medicine. So to bring out a new treatment, you have to go through clinical trials, show that it's better than what's standing, and so forth. But the problem in intensive care is these patients are so unwell, they're often in these induced comas, that A, they can't consent. B, families are very unwilling, quite rightly, to, uh, to, to, to consent their relatives, their loved ones, into these uh, studies. And ethics can, can be sometimes troublesome to get. So they came up with this paradigm, really. And they thought that perhaps the physiological and pathophysiological responses to an extreme environmental challenge, such as going to high altitude, may be similar to those responses or, or, or those responses seen in critical illness. So if we talk about the low levels of oxygen, 90% of patients have low levels of oxygen in intensive care. Up a high mountain where the pressure is much lower, everyone up there suffers from low levels of oxygen. So they thought going very high would mirror being in intensive care. The low oxygen up there would be the low, similar to the low oxygen down there. And they thought, to progress this, that if they then took these healthy people, so people like you and I sat around today, and took them to high altitude, they could look at who did well and who did badly at high altitude, look at them from the outside, but also look at all their physiological parameters and measure lots of things going on in their blood and body, and they could see who did well and who did badly in front of us. They could then look at the people who did well when they walked up a high mountain, and see, well, what were they doing, or what were they doing that was different to those that were doing very badly? What was it that was allowing them to cope well and functionally be lucid, such as Dan on the top of Everest? What was it that was allowing him to do so well at the top of Everest, whereas if I tried strolling up there, I'd certainly do very badly? And if they could then find what allows some people to do well in those low levels of oxygen, they could translate that back to the intensive care unit and perhaps allow people in the intensive care unit to cope better with low levels of oxygen. For example, if they found there was a, a certain molecule in the blood of the people, in the you know, high levels of a certain molecule in the blood of uh, people who cope very, very well at high altitude, they could perhaps synthesize that molecule, give it to the unwell patients in intensive care units, and allow them to perhaps cope better with the hypoxic or the low oxygen insult that people obviously encounter in intensive care. So that's really why we did the, the expedition in 2007, why we're going to go back again. It's really this translational approach from a high altitude environment that mirrors the intensive care or the hospital setting. It is indeed an unorthodox approach. People are now really accepting it, but in 2007, when they went for the first time, certainly there were a lot of skeptics among us. And so Edmund Hillary, the legend that he is, certainly didn't help our cause when he, uh, when he wrote that nobody climbs mountains um, for scientific reasons. Science is used to raise money for the expedition but you can really climb for the hell of it. 
So as much as I respect him, he certainly didn't make things very easy for us. When we, in 2007, we did summit, we're not summiting this time, so we can, you know, argue against him there. And people do argue that, you know, this is just a, a boys' club climbing up mountains. It certainly did in 2007, but it's become much more understood and respected now, and certainly we've had hundreds of publications from 2007. It is widely respected now. Some people do ask, and very rightly, why do we not just put people in the chamber? So at altitude, we are suffering from uh, a low oxygen, low oxygen, which is derived from the low pressure. We could theoretically do this in a chamber, or one of these chambers, either of these chambers. The chamber on the left, as you look at it, is actually a chamber we have at UCL, which is up by Archway. And that is a normal pressure chamber. And we just turn the oxygen levels down, really. So we can turn the levels down to about 11%. The normal oxygen levels here are about 21%. The chamber on the right is one with our collaborators in Duke in America, which is we, we alter the pressure, which drops the oxygen levels. And they certainly do have their place. Um, we can do some, many more invasive trials and look at people because they're almost in a hospital setting. But they are very expensive to buy. They're very expensive to run. And I can almost guarantee that if I offered anyone here the chance to walk to Everest over three weeks or sit into a tiny box about the size of this for three weeks, most people would probably opt for the Everest. Maybe, maybe not. Certainly I would. So the chamber does have its place, but not on large-scale expeditions such as the ones we do. So that is case. That's why we do it. And the first expedition was Cordwell Extreme Everest, named after our major sponsor, James Cordwell. This expedition ended up putting 24 people on the summit of Everest, and it was led by the chap in the very center called Mike Grocott, uh, and um, he certainly masterminded it as absolute credit, thanks to him. He's got the UCL flag on the top of Everest, proudly bearing it. So when they went to Everest in 2007, bearing in mind what we've talked about briefly, what were the questions they had in mind? Well, they wanted to see what governs performance or how well one does at altitude in that low level of oxygen. We are using altitude as the... The, the, the case for uh, really for the low oxygen it provides. So what governs how well one does in the low levels of oxygen? Is it to do with how much oxygen they have in their body? Is it to do with how they deliver that oxygen around their body? Was it to do with how your body uses oxygen? Do they become a bit more efficient with using what little oxygen they have? Could they manipulate important mechanisms to alter outcome? If it's you know, if it was all down to the DNA, then perhaps we wouldn't be able to bring that into the hospital setting and alter someone's DNA, because we can't really do that. But were there things that we could theoretically find that we could translate to the hospital setting? And also, they did want to look at, are genetics important? Is it all down to genetics or not? So they planned the expedition. And the way this expedition works is that they got lots of healthy volunteers. And I should say that everyone who goes on the expedition as an investigator, such as myself, has to do exactly what the volunteers do, plus a lot, lot more. So I know there's some subjects here in the audience, and I, I feel your pain. And I'm hobbling because I've had a muscle biopsy, which we haven't in, uh, made anyone else do. Uh, so we, got, we get about 200 healthy people, like I said, that, that's kind of homogenous population. And we get them in groups of 14. And they come to our lab in London, or when 2007 did, they came to the lab in London, and they had some experiments done on themselves. And we could then see what happened to their body or what is happening in their body when they are in 21% oxygen, so within normal oxygen levels. We'll then fly them out in their groups of 14 to Nepal, where they got to Kathmandu. So they've gone from about 75, 100 meters to about 1,000 meters, and we repeat all the same experiments. And so we've turned down the knob in the hospital setting. We're turning down the oxygen levels, and we repeat everything again, and we can now say, well, has anything changed if we've turned the oxygen levels down? They then stroll up to about 3,500 meters up through the valleys, and we repeat again everything to see, well, now they've got the third amount of oxygen they had at, base, at, at sea level. Has anything changed? And then the group of 200 in their groups of 14, staggered by four days, strolled up to 5,500 meters, which is Everest Base Camp, and again, we did everything again. So we could see progressively, as we were turning down the oxygen knob on people, what was happening to their physiology, who was starting to feel absolutely awful, who was coping very well indeed. We also then sent some investigators. We had about 50 investigators out there. We sent some of them higher and higher up the mountain. So from 5,500 meters, some went up to 6,500, some went up to 8,500, and some went just below 9,000 to the summit of Everest. 
where they did take things such as an exercise bike right up to just below the top to do exercise tests and continue doing what we had subjected everyone else to. So it was a, a, a really an observational study of what was happening as we were turning down that option, that incremental decrease in oxygen. This is not Everest, but does anyone actually know where this is? Anyone can shout out. Kilimanjaro, exactly. This is not, uh, and many of you may have been here, many of you may not. Um, but this is Kilimanjaro, which is just a shade under 6,000 meters. So it is a bit higher. If you were sat on top of that, you are a bit higher than Everest Base Camp. The problem with this mountain, it's a very nice mountain, it looks very nice, is that it's also one of the da most dangerous mountains in the world. Not because it is difficult to climb, because lots of people walk up it. I'm not taking anything away from some people who do it. But it is because it is relatively easy to climb that lots of people do attempt it, and they can almost run up this mountain. And people do try running up this mountain. At 6,000 meters, you really have to take things slowly. And the danger of this mountain is that everyone's getting altitude sickness, more and more people, because they do try and rush up this mountain. You should ascend at perhaps a couple of hundred meters, 500 meters a day, and people are trying to run up and down this mountain in two or three days. So people do get very ill. And on the subject of the altitude sickness, we're just going to do a little bit of physiology. It's simple physiology. So when one goes to altitude, various things happen to your body. We have turned the oxygen levels down, so your body has to try and cope, and it has to take its time to cope. We can't just run up Kilimanjaro, because then our body hasn't got that time to go through the, the, the physiological changes to allow it to compensate. So what does happen? Well, if we think back to Dan, who's just come off the summit of Everest, his heart was beating a lot, lot quicker. His lungs, he was breathing a lot more, so he was getting more oxygen in, getting rid of his carbon dioxide. And when that oxygen was in the lungs, his heart was beating very quickly to pass that oxygen around the body. He had also increased his red blood cell numbers, so the little cells that carry the oxygen around the body. So these are some of the basic things that do happen at altitude. But it does take time, and if you do rush up mountains, you can get very ill. So these were some of the things we looked at in 2007 to look at how people were coping, and was it purely down to these factors? Was person X doing so much better because he was breathing far quicker, his heart might have been pumping quicker, his oxygen levels had gone on? But what did we find? So in 2007, we did see on this graph, it's a bit complex, but really it just shows as you go higher up the mountain, the oxygen levels, which are the white bars, are dropping. Your oxygen saturations, which are the bars next to it, are dropping. But your red blood cell number is increasing. So it's going up and up and up as you're slowly walking up the mountain over about 14 or 15 days. So you are getting more oxygen, more red blood cells in your body, and you're able to carry around that oxygen more efficiently. So is it down to the fact that those who have more red blood cells and therefore can carry more oxygen around the body, is it down to the fact that those guys cope far, far better? Well, not necessarily. So these are two chaps. The one on the right is an extremely fit gentleman. He's run ultramarathons. He still runs marathons at whatever age he is now. But he's extremely fit. He cannot cope at altitude at all, even though he went on the same ascent profile as the chap on the right, who is no one would describe as being fit or not necessarily healthy. But he, they went up on exactly the same speed. If you look at their numbers, the CaO2 is the oxygen content, so how much oxygen they have in their body, it's pretty much exactly the same. One chap had to be helicoptered off Everest at 5,500 meters. This chap went on up to the summit of Everest, and they suffered from absolutely no he suffered no problems. So their oxygen content, the amount of oxygen in your body, it seems, doesn't make a blind bit of difference if you cope well or if you cope badly. What else do they do in 07? Well, they took exercise bikes up there. So exercise bikes allow us to look at performance. They're an indicator of how well one can do at altitude. We get people on a bike, we get them to cycle, we change the resistance, and we can look at how greater resistance they can cycle against here and for how long and we do it again at altitude, and we see how much it may drop by or even go up. We weren't sure. But we took these up, and we took them all the way up to pretty much the summit of Everest. They're also, I should say, used in hospitals for when patients have to undergo an operation. An operation is really a big insult. You're getting stabbed with a knife in a lot of cases, and it's a bit of an insult to the body. So nowadays in hospitals, if people are undergoing major surgery, put them on a bike and get an idea of their fitness. So will they have enough physiological reserve to get over this surgical insult. So this is these bicycle tests. 
And they were very, very useful. So what did we find? Well, we found, as you probably all guess, if I was to put you on a bicycle here and ask you, are you going to do better or worse with no oxygen, you'd probably all say far worse. And you'd be correct, which is jolly good. So at 5,300 meters, where the oxygen levels are a little over half of what we've got here, uh, the amount of exercise, really, we could do on a bike had dropped by well over a third. When the team continued up the mountain, it had dropped uh, by over half. They could do only about 40% of the exercise they could do at sea level. So there was a dramatic drop in performance at, at altitude. Interestingly, this column in the end, which is 5,300 meters and 5,300 meters, this column is when people had been at altitude for eight weeks. So their body had had all that time to acclimatize, all that time to make more red blood cells, all that time to you know, go through their physiological changes to allow them to cope better. And actually, people felt far better in themselves, but didn't make a difference after eight weeks or after two days. They could still only do the same amount of, uh, of exercise at altitude. So we weren't exactly sure what was going on. The bikes also told us it didn't matter if you're male or female. There was no indicator males didn't do better than girls or vice versa. There was no difference in age. People of different ages didn't cope better or do better than other people. Fitter individuals at sea level actually did far worse at altitude. Um, and we were not more efficient. We didn't use oxygen in a more efficient manner than we thought we is one of the things we hypothesized that with little oxygen about, we'd use it more efficiently, and this was not the case. In 07, they also looked at the blood flow under their tongue, and this is Dan sat in front of Everest with a little camera. And this camera is a, gives real-time images. It magnifies the blood vessels under your tongue, and I'm sorry, it's not a very clear picture, but what you can maybe make out is a black is blood vessels. Now, this isn't real time because it's a frozen still picture, but it's magnified to such an extent that you can see individual red blood cells floating around or, or flowing, rushing around your tongue. And this is the microcirculation, so the very small blood vessels, not the veins that you see on your arms, but the tiny little vessels that really give the blood to the cells and the mitochondria, the little powerhouses of the body. So we looked at them because we thought from the bikes that it wasn't the big blood vessels and the heart pumping. There were no differences between how people's how quickly people's heart pumped, those didn't do better, those didn't do worse, dependent on that. But we thought it may well be down to this. And this was done on a few people, but it did seem to indicate that actually there were gross differences in those who were coping well and those who were coping badly looking at their microcirculation. So the tiny vessels right at the end. And this may be because the microcirculation could act as a bottleneck. It doesn't therefore matter how much oxygen you put in your lungs at the top end or how quick your heart pumps. If you've got a bottleneck much further down the system, which could be the microcirculation if mine was half of Paul's. Paul's going to do better because he can get that much more oxygen through to the very organs, the very end bits that actually need it. We also looked at beetroot. Now, I'm a big fan of beetroot, but lots of people aren't a big fan of beetroot. But that's not why I put beetroot on the pitch, to, to big it up, really. So beetroot is of interest to us because it's a bit of a buzzword in the world of exercise now. It's full of a substance called nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide... From this graph, as you can tell, it, or this picture is pretty complicated, and I haven't really a clue what's going on here. But it is a very complex molecule, and your body does make it. It's a naturally occurring molecule in your body. It's very important in your body. It's used for, um, you know, in your inflammatory responses to things. It's used as a regulator of your metabolism. It's used to determine how big or small your blood vessels are. So it is a very important thing. It is also used to... Um, to match the supply and demand, really, in your microcirculation, so to govern the flow in those very small blood vessels we're talking about. And it is used to control your mitochondria, so the little powerhouses that actually use the oxygen in your body. It was traditionally thought that this substance, nitric oxide, was only made in your body when there was oxygen aplenty. But actually, it's since been found that when levels of oxygen are low, that's another pathway that makes it. So as you go higher up the mountain, or as we went higher up the mountain in 2007, we saw our levels of nitric oxide get higher and higher and higher, as if the body was almost protecting itself, making the substance protect itself. We only looked at it very, a small amount of, in a small amount of people and didn't really do any great depths of uh, studies into nitric oxide. But we did seem to see that as people went higher and higher up the mountain, this substance, nitric oxide, seemed to get more and more prominent within their bloodstream. We also noted that of the people, as we all walked up the mountain, who had been to very high altitudes before, over 8,000 meters, 
their levels of nitric oxide were far, far higher on the way up and were almost um, reproducing themselves or, or uh, getting larger and larger were far, far higher than those who had never been high. And this brings into thought the idea of preconditioning and epigenetics, which we'll touch on briefly. It is a, a big thing, this nitric oxide. The cycling world, the Tour de France are all into it, and all the cyclists now are all eating beetroot. A lot of the people in the uh, Olympics had, had touched on the subject of eating beetroot, so eat beetroot. It's very good for you. Studies have shown, actually, that it, it does seem to reduce the cost of exercise, improves endurance, and, and allows things, you know, allows mitochondrial efficiency to be better. So people are starting to think, well, this could be useful. And we are starting to think, in case, that it could be useful. Following 07, we went to the Alps, and we did actually do an interventional trial. So we gave 15 people a drink that wasn't too tasty, containing large amounts of nitric oxide, and 15 people a drink that didn't have any of the placebo. And it was a blinded trial, a double-blinded trial, and we did lots of physiological measurements on them to see who coped better in altitude. And whilst the data is not yet published, it certainly did show that those who were on nitrate supplementation coped far better with it. On the background of the Alps and 2007, we move on to Extreme Everest 2 for the last 10 minutes. So Extreme Everest 2 is probably going to be the largest ever high altitude research expedition ever undertaken in terms of the science going on. In total, there's about 63 or 60, 63 different studies going on in this study. The trek follows the same profile as we discussed in 2007 in that we're going to get groups of subjects in groups of 14, and they're going to stroll up the mountain at exactly the same ascent profile as they did in 2007. There's going to be about 200 subjects, and there's going to be laboratories, as per last time, in London. There's going to be a laboratory in Namchi Bazaar, which is 3,500 meter base camp, and also then in Kathmandu on the way down. Previously, we looked at people on the way up in Kathmandu, and we found there wasn't much difference between London and Kathmandu but it's never really been looked at the descent data. So what has happened when people have gone up the altitude, been exposed to this low oxygen insult, their body's been you know, hit by this low oxygen, and on the way back down, we're going to look at them and see, well, they're almost back down at sea level. Are they as they were before? Are they not? We don't know. It's not been looked at. We're looking at a number of different cohorts. We're looking at healthy lowlanders, so healthy people like anyone in this room. I'm assuming everyone's healthy. Twins and Sherpas, because we briefly mentioned earlier how good Sherpas are. And we'll come back to them shortly. What do we think is important? Well, beetroot, because you know I love it. Because of the nitric oxide, we really do think this is very important. We think it's important because it governs the microcirculatory blood flow. This tiny blood flow that gives the cells and the mitochondria their, their oxygen, we think that is really very important. And the picture over there is someone having a muscle biopsy to look at their mitochondria and the the good thing about this picture is that there's a anaesthetist who's never done any surgery in their life operating on a consultant surgeon. <laughs> um, so we get our, get our own back on them. But we do think, and what we are really interested in this time, is that the mitochondria, the microcirculation, are hugely important, governed by the beetroot-loving nitric oxide. Sherpas, we briefly mentioned, and I'll briefly talk about. Sherpas are amazing with, in terms of how they cope with oxygen levels. They certainly have been at altitude for about five or 10,000 years. And through natural selection, their body has really learned to cope with the low levels of oxygen. They really do cope. As I'm walking up with perhaps a bum bag up the mountain, they stroll past like this, about half my height, and I can only feel guilty. They are remarkable people. We heard about how quickly they go down mountains. When our team summited Everest, they went up in about 14 days from base camp to the summit of Everest. A Sherpa last year did it in eight hours. So they fly up the mountains. Now, natural selection certainly has had its way on their body, and it has altered their DNA and things. And we can't alter our DNA, but that DNA obviously has downstream effects. So what we want to find, really, is what those downstream effects are. If we can see why Sherpas really are so good at altitude or, or coping with low levels of oxygen, what it is that they do differently from ourselves, and we'll be comparing 40, 50 of them, and a large group of ourselves, if we can see distinct differences between the two populations, it gives us an idea of we really need to focus on that. In brief, we do know a little bit about them. There's not a lot of research. We know their oxygen, their, their red blood cell numbers are actually lower than ours at altitude. So again, it shows this oxygen content, how much oxygen you have in your body, is probably not important. Their levels are far lower than us, yet they cope far better. 
we know that their oxygen saturations, how much oxygen those red blood cells hold, are slightly higher. Their heart pumps quicker, it uses slightly different substances to pump. Their lungs work in a slightly different way. And the baby picture is that they suffer less problems with giving birth at altitude. The babies, if we give birth at high altitude or are pregnant, we suffer from growth restriction. They don't have any of those problems because their body has diverted large percentage of the blood flow in their abdomen and their tummy to, to feed the placenta as such. So lots of work, lots over time, they've certainly come up with lots and lots of different ways of dealing with that, coping, coping with that insult. They are simply remarkable. And one small paper, which was only on a small number of people, did suggest that they had much higher levels of nitric oxide in their body, and they had much higher microcirculatory blood flow. So things that we independently found in 2007 by looking at ourselves, one very small paper, well, it's not really a small paper, but one paper has suggested they have far higher numbers. So again, it ties in. Very briefly, I should mention that not all high altitude populations are the same. There's three, really, the Ethiopians, Andeans, and the Sherpas. And if we look at what data is out there, they all seem to have come up with slightly different ways of coping with this low oxygen insult. So there isn't necessarily one uniform way of dealing with it, but we're going to look at those who have been at high altitude for the longest and hoping they've come with the best way. And we are coming to the end. Another thing we're really looking at is this thing called epigenetics. Now, these are two identical twins, and they have identical DNA. Their DNA is identical, as is probably not in this room, but that's not really the end of the story. There's this thing called epi or epigenetics. And epigenetics was found out about in the 19th century, early 19th century, and it really describes about the, the punctuation of, of, of one's DNA. So whilst everyone's genetics are the same, well, no, are different, and in identical twins, their genetics are the same, their epigenetics may be different. So if we take this sentence, and if I ask you the question, can I eat fish? Let's assume that our genome, so our DNA within our body, was the paragraph. The DNA would be the letters and the words in this paragraph. But if we punctuate this sentence, it can mean two totally different things. So if I was going to a restaurant and I was asked if I could eat fish, if I replied, I am severely allergic to nuts and fish, I don't mind bananas and apple and pears are good, I would hope they wouldn't give me any fish. If I alter the punctuation, we get a total different meaning, and suddenly I can eat fish. I am severely allergic to nuts and fish, I don't mind, bananas, apples and pears are good. So epigenetics is really the punctuation of one's DNA, and it alters how one can express your DNA, how much is expressed, how much isn't. And that is something that has recently been found to change in one's lifetime. So if you go up high and are subjected to an insult like low oxygen, it may be that your epigenetics, your DNA, may be the same, but your epigenetics may have totally changed. So this is one thing we're looking at. And before we close, we are in the, in the, in the stage of sea level testing. So there are people in this audience who have been to our lab. We are due to go to Everest in four weeks. Our shipment is actually going this afternoon. But here we are, all subjecting ourselves to science. So what do we think is important in summary? Well, we do think it's a microcirculation. Tibetans have got a good microcirculation. We do think it's a mitochondria. We haven't ever looked at Tibetans or Sherpa's mitochondria or even our own mitochondria really at altitude, but we think that's going to be important. And we think this substance, nitric oxide, is very important. Hopefully, if we can then find substance, for example, this nitric oxide, this substance, if we do find it to be very important, can be manufactured quite easily, and we could theoretically then administer it to patients in need in intensive care units and help our ultimate aim, which is to help those patients in the intensive care units. And I leave you with this picture of my inspiration. This chap is Jim Millage. He is a, the physiologist for Sir Edmund Hillary when he climbed Everest. He is now 84, but even at age 82, well, four years ago, he came up the mountain to about 5,000, 6,000 meters with us. And he continues to do studies. He continues to come down to the lab to help us. So he certainly is an inspiration. And I'd like to say many thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thanks, Ned. That was really fascinating. Okay, we've got one first question in the middle. Could you wait for the microphone, please? Right. So yeah, just there. <clears throat> if you so, if you could just repeat the yeah, first so, part. So, but, um, so, so my question is, uh, if what I've said, the first thing I've said, is true, is there any indication that a similar effect is at play in terms of altitude that people that cope well 
come from one of those types of mitochondria predominantly? So yeah, the, the, the first part of the question was that there seem to be a number of different types of mitochondria, and some people such as athletes have a more predominant type than the other. Now, I'm not a mitochondrial expert. There's a group of Cambridge who are collaborating with us who are looking at that. But not really much work has been done looking at mitochondria in climbers and high-altitude people, and certainly none has ever been looked at in Sherpas. A little bit of work has been done, and it seems to show that within um, a cell, the different, different portions of mitochondria, different areas of mitochondria, uh, decrease in, if you look at a cell as a whole, you may find after a time at altitude that certain pockets of mitochondria do seem to change in their numbers, some increase, some decrease. But we've never, they've never really looked at what happens at altitude with the different types of, of mitochondria. Certainly something is going on. And in the lab right now, they're actually taking our blood muscle samples from some people, and rather than just freezing them and looking at the, the function as a whole or, or looking at what it looks like, they're actually doing tests on it whilst it is still almost live for, 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 by giving it substrate, and they can then look at exactly what type of substance it's, it's using, whose is more efficient, whose isn't. Uh, so they're doing this real-time thing, so they can then get a much greater idea of how a mitochondria does it differ from each other and what's going on in it. If it's not um, oxygen content, why does Lance Armstrong win the Tour de France when he's taken EPO? That's a very good question. As we all know, he has taken EPO, though. Um, so, interestingly, we, we, we are not sure. So, oxygen content, and it may be dependent on at sea level where they cycle in at altitude. At altitude, if you increase your oxygen levels, your oxygen content, the way we increase our oxygen content is by increasing our red blood cells. And that is how we increase our oxygen content. At altitude, the problem with increased oxygen content is that it can cause, well, it becomes more viscous, your blood, and it may have problems, therefore, getting around into the microcirculatory blood flow. Again, down here, it may become slightly more viscous, but there may be different mechanisms to play. He's obviously also an extreme athlete that does lots of fitness anyway, so he may also be starting off with the ultimate microcirculation through his training, and it may, you know, that, that go together. But certainly at altitude, and this may be a reason why Sherpas have actually, through time, decided having a high oxygen content, a high level of oxygen isn't good. This thickened blood can actually cause things as clots. You're at higher chances of getting blood clots, lung clots on your lung, clots on your legs. So certainly it seems detrimental at high altitude. But with regards to Lance Armstrong, you're very true. What, what is it that allows down here them to cope better or, or to seemingly get better results with EPO training? I, I'm not sure. Very good question. How's that? Yeah, good. Does ambient temperature have an, uh, an additional effect on oxygen levels? Because um, I've heard experienced climbers say that at altitude, when the weather is extremely bad, um, they feel more breathless and have more difficulty. Or is that an effect on your microcirculation? Um, and, and that's something that we have trouble confounding for, really, because temperature does make a difference. Certainly, temperature at altitude makes a difference because of the pressure in the air. So. And that is why they almost have climbing seasons in Everest. So when the, pressure, the, the, the weather is bad, the pressure is even lower, so the oxygen levels are even lower. So people do find it, there may be a storm and your visibility is awful, but also the oxygen levels, because the pressure's gone down, those oxygen levels. You really are on a knife edge, and certainly when you're above 7,000 peak, you're in the death zone and your time is very, very limited. So if you're on that knife edge and the weather turns and you just not take away a tiny little bit more of oxygen, that certainly is the biggest problem. Temperature itself as well is problematic with your microcirculation. Or certainly, we've not really looked at the changes in your microcirculation with temperature, but your larger vessels, you naturally, you naturally constrict. So all the blood vessels in your fingers and toes, like you probably all know on a cold day, they get very, your fingers really hurt because that's because your vessels are constricting. So we don't know on the microcirculation what happens, but certainly on the, the larger blood vessels, temperature can have a direct effect on that, which does in turn affect blood flow and blood delivery. So, time for one very last quick one, and a quick answer, because then we need to leave. Oh, sorry, the sorry. <laughs> um, regarding the beetroot, does it matter how it's prepared? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of what my favorite is. Uh, no, I'm a big fan of beetroot. No, it, it doesn't seem to. Rawer the better, I imagine. But uh, I'd encourage everyone to, to eat it. Certainly, I don't know how it how it should be prepared, but uh, do eat it. Or spinach, green vegetables, anything like that. They're all good for you. Eat well.
Okay. Thank you all very much, and thanks, Ned. Thank you. Fantastic.